what happened this week, okay? I am, for those of you who know me, I, I'm writing a book. I'm, I'm very close to being finished. It's probably being released this year, okay? I'm very excited about this. Yes. We had a, a power outage this week, and it fried something. I am beyond anxious. My new power supply gets in tomorrow. If it's not that, maybe, maybe my brother-in-law can save the hard drive. Maybe. Amen. Amen, amen. But, uh, man, I don't want to get this. So with, this, with that kind of week, I'm like, please, God, tell me I saved the PowerPoint. I did. You know, there, there's, a, there's a computer computer joke that we tell amongst ourselves says young guys. We say, Jesus saves. You should too. It's the idea that you always save your documents. When you're writing something, always save it. Back it up. Always, always, always. Anyways, so we're going to be looking at... at uh, just before we get going here, your dad started doing this, and I thought it was the stupidest thing in the world. I was like, that's just a dumb idea, Riddle. And, uh, and then I got to thinking about it, and I said, you know, that's actually kind of a good idea. Because it doesn't break up the flow of the service, so I, I think we're, we're going to start doing this. Um, if you're wanting a little bit something deeper than, than, on, than on Sundays, I encourage you to come to one of our midweek services. We've got Wednesday night at 7, it is for adults of really any age. Um, we've got specialized group for young adults and, and, and for... Uh, women and that kind of stuff, but if you just want a general class to go deeper than we do on Sundays, I highly encourage you to come to Wednesday night. That's pretty much where it's at. Um, it, it's actually called Going Deeper is the name of the class. So, I mean, I think you're going to find it a little bit deeper there. Anyways, and then next Sunday morning, uh, Pastor will be continuing on his Defining Discipleship, Loving Well. I uh, would encourage you to come to that. It's been good so far. Uh, every, at the end of every one of his messages, we give him a ranking, and he has to get a ranking of higher than 8 out of 10 to be a lot of pastor here, so yeah. I'm joking, that's a joke um, okay, so we'll be looking at true rest tonight um, you know, a lot of us in life want rest but a lot of us don't find it you know, and then we get saved and we think well, where's this rest that we're supposed to have so we're going to talk about that tonight, true rest and uh, we'll be looking at this over the span of a few weeks um, the, this is part one, it's God's rest it's kind of the idea for it um, right at the beginning of the Bible, and we'll look at that in just a second. But you know, I grew up in California. I'm sorry, but I did. I, it's it's nine years that I will never get back. <laughs> and uh, I remember when I was nine, driving out of California and saying, "Well, I'm never going back there again." It's uh, you know, it's kind of like when Israel left Egypt. You know, bye, so long. Thanks for all the fish. And. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like that, you know, but then a few years later I went back because I had, I think it was a, a cousin um, getting married. Not, I didn't move back, I visited, because uh, I had a, a cousin getting married, um, and it wasn't how I remembered it. And that was just after, after a few years. You remember things differently, and the, the thing is, some things we're so used to that we actually end up missing it in total. You know what I mean? I'll give you another quick example, marriage. You know, once you've been married a couple of years, you, you kind of forget about all of its benefits. You know what I mean? Like, you just kind of get used to it. You get used to somebody being married, and you're just like, well, it's just, that's just what we do. It's our system. And we start taking things for granted. It, it's just like that you, you start taking advantage of things. Um, and so that, I, I kind of wanted to, uh, to show you this. And what do you guys see when you see that? If you're like most people, you see a beach. This is the sand with rocks, and there's there's the ocean. You're all wrong. It's the bottom of a garage door. This is the bottom of the garage door. It's been dented right here, but that's definitely the garage door there. And uh, that right there is his, gra it is his pavement. Into his you see, sometimes we get so used to looking at something a certain way that we don't even consider. But it could be something. Well, that it could be something better. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. Um, the creation of the world is one of those things that people go to wanting it to say what they want it to say, but don't actually pay attention to what it's saying. Now, if you are at all familiar with science and everything in recent years, you'll know that there's a whole lot of controversy going on about how old the Earth is and whether evolution was a thing or what. There is, it's out there all over the place. So, you know, if you're, if you're not aware of that, I mean, you're, you're really locked away. You should get out more. Um, and I'm not going to answer the question of, of how old the Earth is or any of that. Rather, I'm going to focus, focus on something way more important. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 1 and going through chapter 2. 
And some people, if you're familiar with, um, if you read a lot, for instance, John Walton made this view pretty popular recently, that Genesis 1 wasn't meant to be taken literally. It was more of just a story to combat um, the, the, uh, the false religions of the day. Other people take it super seriously and say that everything in science has to mesh up with it. I mean, there's just a whole lot of people going to the extremes on this. Um, and so that kind of brings up the question, should it be taken seriously? Can we trust it? Did this actually happen? How are we supposed to understand it? Now, before you start saying this is going to be a lesson about absolutely nothing, hold your horses. Okay? We're going to talk about some facts, and then we're going to talk about some applications. So don't get carried away here. Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the expanse, and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. Then God said, let the waters be, I'm sorry, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees, and the earth uh, bearing fruit, tree, and fruit after their kind with seed in them, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plant, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind, and God saw that it was good. Now I want you to notice something. It doesn't say that God caused everything to miraculously appear. I do want you to notice that at the beginning, he created the, the universe and the earth, but then it says after that that he caused things to happen. Now look at this. There is evening and there is morning and third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens, and separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, and it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning and fourth day. Okay, so there was just a few more days left. Then God said that the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly across the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. Now, I want to kind of back up there. Did you hear what he said there? He said, let the earth sprout forth vegetation. He didn't say, let plants suddenly appear. He said, let the earth sprout forth vegetation. Now, why is that important? Because this tells us something very important about God's character. God oftentimes uses processes to work in our lives yeah. rather than making everything appear. Now, why is, that, why is that important? Because as you're praying for stuff, sometimes God's not going to just answer Sometimes God's going to use a drawn-out process. Why? Because he likes to do that sometimes. Sometimes he's going to make something suddenly appear like he did in verse 1. But then some other times he's not. Like in verse wherever that was, uh, 10 or whatever. <laughs> then God said, the, oh, the water seems, I already said that. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarmed after their kind, and, after, and every winged bird after its kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply in the earth. There is evening and there is morning, a fifth day. Then God said that the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind, and God saw that it was good. Now, now that word cattle there might not be the, the most accurate, but think of more livestock. Um, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now, notice what he says here. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Unlike every other thing that he created, he addresses us differently than he addressed every other thing. See what he says back here? Let the waters teem with swarms of fish. Let the, let the earth produce, produce this. Let this happen. But this is the only thing he created that he talks about differently. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, why is that important? Because we have value as people from creation. Praise God. Amen. No matter all the good things you do in your life, it's not going to make you any more loved by God. You were created with value. It's inherent in your being. 
God created you in his likeness. That's why murder is wrong. And that's why killing an animal is not wrong. Because you were made in the image of God. He elaborates on that later on. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Do you think maybe he wants you to get the grasp that he's saying, hey, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. And subdue it and roll over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, in chapter 2, it's going to backtrack to chapter to day 6 again. So don't get... Don't get confused. There's a lot of things that happen on day six, man. He caused all these land animals, and then, you know, he also caused people. Then he caused Adam to name all the animals. Then Adam fell asleep, and then he created Eve. All this stuff is happening on day six. So there's just like a crap ton of stuff happening on day six. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which is fruit yielding seed it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every uh, bird of the sky, and to every living thing that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant food. And it was so. Now, I want you to notice a few things. First off, God never gave animals for people to eat until after the flood. Right. So that's kind of an important point. God saw, no, not, not for today. It's, it's completely irrelevant for what we're talking about today. I just want to put that out there. Uh, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Okay, and then, well, we'll, we'll, just a few more verses. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. And verse 4, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day, singular, day, uh, that the Lord uh, God made earth and heaven. So the first thing... It's kind of important is whenever we go to a passage like this, I want you to take all the garbage you have, which is throw it away. Because right now, what a lot of you are probably doing is you're gonna you're probably thinking, oh great, he's gonna say something about evolution. I promise I'm not gonna say anything about evolution. Except for what I just said about not saying anything about it. That's it. I'm I'm not gonna go out there and teach some heresy, okay? But I want you to take all the things that you think you know about this passage and throw it away. Because right now your mind's probably going something like this. The earth was created in 24 hour days. Seven 24-hour days, and that everything after Genesis 1 was after day 7, and then something about evolution. So let's take all that garbage and throw it away. First off, the Bible never actually says, right here, it says, in, in, your, in your translation, it's going to say something like, and there was evening and there was morning. That's not in the Hebrew. That's been added. It just says, evening, morning, whatever day. Okay, that's kind of an important point. Now, I'm going to draw out why it's important to think, but the second problem is the word that's translated in most Bibles as day doesn't actually mean day. It means period of time. So here we have two problems with the big point I'm trying to get across. Just get that nonsense out of your head about it being 24-hour days because that's not the point of the passage. God is trying to teach us something, but we've turned Genesis 1 into an argument. So instead of listening, we've used it to try and combat science. What? What? When God is trying to tell you something, stop putting in your own words and listen to what he's saying. Because there's something here that points to our salvation that is absolutely essential for us to know. But we can't ever know it if we're too busy having arguments about nothing. Do you know how important it is if the earth is billions of years old or thousands of years old? Not at all. Not at all. We've made it a big deal. We've made it a big deal. So let's go into Genesis 1 and say, God, show me. God, teach me. That's, that's what God wants us to know. Okay, so just a few things. Um, I highly suspect that the days were longer than, than 24 hours because of all the stuff that had to have happened in them. Um, obviously, all the, all the things that, that, that had to grow and everything. But honestly, eh, it doesn't really seem like that big of an important point. But here's, here's something that I do want to point out. Days were not established until day four. The sun was created on day one, but it wasn't given a purpose until day four. So it couldn't have been 24 hour days if you think about it because there was no such thing as a day. Kind of an important point. So remember that when you go to argue about people, about stupid stuff, ask yourself, is this an important argument to have? And if it's not, then don't argue about it. Um, and another thing, uh, if you notice in chapter two, it actually clarifies all this happened in the day. That God created. 
singular. It's not, it's not a plural word. They translated that correctly. It's singular in the day. But they just happened in seven days. Once again, the, the word that's translated as day here doesn't mean always 24-hour periods. It can mean 12-hour periods. It can mean a span of time. For instance, the day of the Lord. When was that? Well, part of the day of the Lord was when Jesus came. Another part of the day of the Lord is sometime in the future. So that means a day can be at least 2,000 years. See what I mean? So we've turned a, a passage here into an argument. Which obviously, if you don't know anything about God, let me kind of clarify you on this. He doesn't want you to be mean and hateful to people. He doesn't want you to go around picking fights. No. I know enough about God to know that. Right. Now, with that being said, with that being said, it really never tells us how long the days are. Okay, well, so that brings up the question. So. Can we trust this story? Did it actually happen, or is it just a story? Because if you pay attention to modern research, everybody seems to think that none of these things actually happen. You read book after book about how it's just a story to teach us. Well, so is it just a story? And if so, does it really have anything to really teach us if it's just a story? If it's no better than Hercules, well then why read it? Why waste our time reading something that's just nothing but a cleverly devised story? So if you think about it, it's kind of an important point that we ask the question, can we trust this? And for that, I would like to take a brief stroll through modern science and show that everything in modern science actually validates exactly what the Bible just said. First off is Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. This is an event that scientists call the Big Bang. It has been proven and validated by science. So once again, we have science proving the Bible right. Okay. So now let's go to the next thing it says. Um, it all, some people have said something about um, how it should be translated. Uh, let me think if I can remember. Between verse 1 and verse 2, how it should be translated as a span of time. In other words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. After a span of time, the earth was formless and void. But actually, if you look at the Hebrew, it translates a lot better that, like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. Talking about the same day. That creation out of nothing will happen on day one. It, what, there wasn't, some people teach that there's like this in-between earth that happened. You know, like the earth that was, and then something happened, and then the seven days of creation. That's completely not what the Hebrew text is saying. If you actually translate it yourself, you'll see, and the earth was formless and void. Same day. There were seven days of creation. Okay? Once again, we don't know how long those days were, but there were seven of them. Science tells us that when the Earth was very young, there were thick clouds around it, which is actually elementary for its creation. If you read in Job and here in Genesis, it says that there was thick darkness, and in Job it actually says that the thick darkness was thick clouds. So here we have, again, a minute detail that science proves happened. Now, if you know anything about science, they tried to disprove that this couldn't have happened because the water wasn't on the Earth in the beginning. It, it came to Earth through meteors hitting the Earth. Which, besides the idea that that's sounding completely stupid, um, yeah, they actually did a recent study and found out that no, the Earth was there, the water was there the whole time, just like the Bible said. Now, remember, this book was written 3,400 years ago, before science was ever even a thing. So, already you're noticing a pattern of it constantly being validated by science. So let's go back to the question, can we trust it? Well, I would think so, yeah. Just because we don't know how long those seven days were doesn't mean that the seven days didn't happen. That's right. That's right. But it keeps getting better, guys. Um, let me see, where am I? Verse 12. It's, um, it, it says in verse 12 that the plants started growing before animals. Um, for the longest time, science said, well, no, animals came first. There were water animals before there were plants. Actually, that's incorrect. Water plants came first, and then water animals, and then land plants, and then the rest of the, of the water animals. So once again, no, the Bible is correct. Um, in verse 14, it said, um, let the lights be, f no, I'm sorry. In verse 14, it says, then God said, let there be lights in the expanse. This is once again kind of a, a misleading translation. A more accurate translation would be, let the lights be for separating. Instead of let there be lights for separating, 
let the lights be for us ever. In other words, God is not creating something here. He's assigning a task to something here. It's a very big difference. Because it says in, in verse 1, uh, verse 1 through 3, that God had already created the sun. So we have him recreating it here? Contradiction? No. Here, if you translate it correctly, he's giving what he created a purpose. He's assigning a duty. He's actually going to do that with the rest of the days, too. He's created the earth. He's created the land and the water. Now he's going to give a purpose to those things by adding something to it. He's created a bunch of void things, a bunch of things that have nothing in them. And now he's assigning duty to it. Creating purpose. So now we get to verse 20, and it says, Then God said that the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. Um, we found that water animals are, uh, came, to, came to life first before land animals. In fact, some scientists even assert that without the, without the existence of water, there can be no life. I don't know about that. I'm not a scientist. But I do know that I think that it's awfully convenient how the Bible actually says things in the order that science is showing us. Next is something called the Cambrian Explosion. Now, if you know anything about this, um, it was the event that caused all the life that currently exists to suddenly appear out of nowhere. Now, there was some forms of life before the Cambrian explosion, explosion this kind of beside the point, but the thing is, does it happen too suddenly to be accounted for by evolution? I mean, it, it's possible that God could have caused it to evolve, then it would have happened in time, but left alone to its own devices, it is impossible for evolution to have taken this, taken hold this quickly. When we, look at, when we look at the fossils, it's impossible that it came to be that fast. Because the amount of time that it would take, hypothetically, for evolution to be true, if it was true, is too long of a time for the little bit of time that life appeared at. So here we have quite a few problems that the Bible resolves. First off, how was there nothing and then there was something? Everything in our universe can be dated. Nothing that we have ever found is eternal. So where did it all come from? Well, the Bible clarifies that. How come there was nothing and the life came from nothing? How come non-life was able to produce life? Well, the Bible kind of gives us a clue on that one too. How come from life we were able to develop, to develop into conscious beings? The Bible gives us the answer for that one too. So here um, in verse 26, it says that man showed up last. Do you know what science has discovered? That man was the last one to show up. Yeah. Isn't it funny? So now let's return to the original question I asked. Regardless of how long the seven day periods were, can we trust Genesis 1 as an actual event that really did happen? Yes, yes we can. But the problem is, is that we're getting people saying things in school and we're getting people saying things at home. And, and people, kids are really the, realizing the disconnect. And so they're starting to say, okay, so the Bible is just stories. And what we learn in school, that's actually profitable for real knowledge. No. See, and so there's this disconnect happening. And part of Christian, uh, Christianity is actually making the problem worse. Because rather than engaging with the difficult issues, we're just kind of ignoring them. Now, I don't know about you, but kids, I, I realize that my kids are, are pretty curious. If we don't wrestle with the hard questions, they won't see us as credible sources of information. And if they don't see us as credible sources of information, why the heck would they believe what we have to say? You just believe a book of myths. That thing's not been proven. It has contradictions all over the place. Prove them wrong. If you're, not proven, if, you, if you're not proving that the Bible is true, then why should they believe that it is? See what I mean? But for too long, we've had this idea in Christianity that we can just ignore the hard questions. It's okay, just ignore it. But that's not the way it's going to work. Our kids will go out for looking for answers. And don't let the world be the only one who gets giving it to them. Don't let the world be the only ones answering your kids' hard questions. We've got, we've got, a, we've got a generation out there who, who watches a lot of porn. Like, a lot of porn. We're talking about like 80 something percent of, of the adult population is involved in pornography in some way. 80 something percent. Holy smokes. 
I tell you what, pastors shouldn't have wasted so much time talking about homosexuality when there's only a few percent of the American population that's homosexual. They should have spent more time talking about pornography when there's 80-something percent of Americans watching. Actually, it's 90-something. I'm sorry, I'm getting my statistics confused. It's 90-something percent. 70 to 80 percent of pastors watch porn. Did you hear what I just said? 90% of the American population watches porn. 70 to 80% of pastors watch it. Should we have wasted so much time talking about homosexuality or should we have talked about something that was maybe a little more important? Wow. I'm just kind of throwing these ideas out. Maybe we need to stop sitting on our butts saying, and actually read the Bible and actually learn from it. Because there's a world out there who needs the voice of Christians. And I don't know about you, but I've noticed that media is trying awful hard to discredit us. And I don't want to turn it into us versus them kind of thing. It really isn't like that. Why should they believe that we're following the Lord, right? God, there's a lot of options out there. I remember Jesus saying, they'll know we are Christians by our love. But I see a lot of times Christians get so involved with, with just nitpicking each other that nothing happens. So let's look at a few last things. So we have a real historical event. Boom. We see that God actually did create it with a historical event of six unspecified amounts of time. And we see that it, it wrestles with a lot of hard answers. What caused the Big Bang? What caused life? What caused human consciousness? Well, the Bible answers all that in Genesis 1. But here's a few other very important points. And the first one I want to say is that Genesis 1 strongly contrasts with the religions of the day. The moon and the sun is not a god. Amen. It was created by God. Yes. Another big thing that, that the other religions believed is they believed that there was this, um, kind of like a goddess, if, if you will. Her name was, I believe, Tiamat. And she got in this cosmic fight with some of the gods that she had created. And long story short, they killed her and they used her to make the earth and the sky, or the sky. No, it was the sky. Anyways. Well, it's a whole convoluted thing. Anyways, so it's this cosmic creation itself is a cosmic struggle between the gods. But in Genesis 1, it's completely void of that. There's no cosmic struggle. There's God simply saying, hey, let this happen, and then it did. Well, that was simple. It's void of, it's void of the pointlessness of humanity. If you read the other, the other creation accounts from, from the, the times of the Genesis were, were written, People were an afterthought by the gods. They got tired of doing all their own work. So they created gods, so that, I mean people, so that people would work for them. But that's not what we see here in Genesis 1. Let us make man in our image. It says that God was hovering, the spirit of God was hovering over the deep. He was intimately involved with his creation. He wasn't a backseat kind of God. He was like, here I am, I'm doing something big. That's the kind of God that we see in Genesis 1. A very important point. Another thing that I want to point out is verse 31 does not say that the, say that the, the world that God created, it never says that he was perfect. It never says that. It says that it was good. And then in, in, on the seventh, sixth day, seventh day, it says that it, that it was very good, but that doesn't mean perfect. See, one thing that people don't understand is that the earth was actually made with pain in it. The earth was made with death in it. Can you imagine how terrible it would have been if plants kept growing and never died? You'd never be able to get anywhere. God created the earth with death in it. Another thing that we see is God created the earth with pain in it. When, when Eve was cursed in chapter 3, it says, I will increase the pain that you have in child labor. He doesn't say, I will give you pain. He says, I will increase it. Pain was already in existence. Pain is a good thing. Pain warns us, hey, don't touch that. That's hot. But we've made this whole account something that it's not. And we think that it was heaven, and then we fell from that heaven, and then heaven is, has to be recreated. It's not what the Bible says at all. It was a creation, much like what we have here. Maybe a little bit better. <laughs> because sin wasn't really a factor. It was a factor, but it wasn't a strong factor. For instance, um, Satan was alive and breathing. So if Satan was alive, obviously sin was a thing. So you got to see that. But, um, also, it says that carnivores uh, were created by God. Carnivores eat meat. Right. To eat meat, you have to kill something. Yep. You, you're, seeing my, you're seeing my process. The reason here, death was created by God. 
So why, oh why, do we die? Doesn't the Bible say something about that? Well, when we sin in the Garden of Eden, it says that we died spiritually. Absolutely. But then also God removed the tree from the Garden of Eden. Now, the tree is very important because as John Walton has actually shown very, very adequately, it was most likely to be eaten regularly. It wasn't a one and done kind of deal. Because see, Hollywood's kind of changed our opinion of the, the fountain of life, right? Do you take a drink of the fountain of life and live forever, right? That, that's not the image that we see in Genesis. We actually see a, a fruit that they have to continually eat. And that's why God had to take it away. It was because he said, lest they keep eating from it, and then they'll live forever and keep doing evil and live forever. So let me take that away from them. So that, they, so that they will eventually die. And that, that issue will resolve itself. You know the good thing about Alf, Alf Hitler? He was going to die eventually. Yes. Um, okay, so here's, after all these things being true, the thing I want to, the things I, I want to get, want you to get from all this, you know, you don't have to agree with me on everything. I can scripturally back up everything I've said tonight. But you don't have to agree with me. That's fine. If you don't believe the Bible, that's okay. It's all right. Uh, but I want you to get something. That I think is very important that, that, that even if you don't believe in the Bible, believe this. God created everything. And this was a historical event. And the final thing that is important to put all these pieces together that I mentioned, remember I said that Genesis 1 has to be read with its idea in mind. The seventh day never ended. That's right. Read it for yourself. Genesis chapter 1. The end of day 1. Uh, let me see. Verse 8, and there was evening and there was morning a second day. And so it's day 2. Uh, day, verse 5 is, is, is uh, day 1. It goes through all these one, and every single one it says, and there was a sixth day. Now let's read what happens on the seventh day. <coughs> Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. By the seventh day God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created in me. Where is the formula? Where does it say evening and morning, the seventh day? It's not there. Why? Because we are in the seventh day. Now, why is that important? Who cares if we're on the seventh day? Because of something very important that it just said. God completed his work, and he rested on the seventh day. This is the very first reference to us being saved. That God has offered us the opportunity to enter his rest. Yeah. This is the basis of everything else we're going to look, through, look at for the next couple weeks, that God rested and we can too. If you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3, it actually picks up on the same thing. But the problem is Hebrews is kind of a difficult to understand book, so a lot of people just don't read it. As a result, they don't really pick up on this kind of stuff. Uh, it's hard to understand something you don't read. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4 verse 3 says, For we have believed, for we who have believed enter that rest. Just as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall enter. Keep hop down to verse 4. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Verse 6. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day today. Saying through David after so long a time, just as has been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So here we have David talking about today be saved, which was the day of salvation, the chance to enter God's rest on the seventh day, thousands of years after Moses wrote Genesis, which was thousands, if not millions, if not billions of years after God created. So here we have a very, very important point. The main point of all of this, the seventh day never ended, enter, never ended and anyone can enter God's rest. To find the peace that you're searching for. The offer still remains today. While it is still called today, the seventh day, there is still a chance to enter that, enter that rest. Now obviously, it's, the, the first step to entering that rest is found in salvation. Surrendering your life to Jesus Christ and saying, Lord, I believe in you. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. That's the first step into that rest. And we're going to talk next week about further steps into that. And then just a second, we're going to, we're going to pray for those. If you, if you haven't uh, accepted Christ as your Savior, if you've never been saved, if you've never been a Christian, um, if you don't know what any of that means, hey, don't worry about it. We've got a pastor. we got three of them. How about that? Um, but the idea here is that anyone can enter into God's rest 
and we can all find that peace that we're searching for. We are still in the seventh day. Don't wait till the seventh day ends. Don't wait till the seventh day ends. If you're at a place, God, I just, I just don't know what to do. Guess what? God does know what he wants you to do. And part of that is surrendering your life to him. He wants to know you deeper and get this. He wants you to know him. See, God knows you completely, but he wants you to know him. So next week, we're going to look at uh, renewing your strength. Um, I'll give you a little, a little cheat. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 40, if you hadn't guessed. Um, and we're just going to look at that. Uh, but I want to kind of close off um, uh, with, with prayer here. Uh, go ahead and close your eyes. Um, 